Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We are at verse 12 to verse 20. This has to rank high on my list of favorite passages in the Scripture. It means a great deal to me, and perhaps more so today than ever before. The subject is abundant grace. A few years ago, I participated in a debate with a lot of great pastors and theologians whom I respected. I was young and new in the ministry, and we were debating the subject of divorce and remarriage and the qualifications for the ministry. There were 13 debates in different cities, and a lot of discussion, a lot of papers were written. Today, after the years have rolled by, now over 20 of them, I look back on that with a great deal of interest. Out of that group of men, and there were a number of them, the ones who held the strongest and what I would call the most legalistic views, the ones who said that no one could divorce his wife for any reason at all under any circumstances, every last one of them today are divorced. I guess time causes you to think about a lot of issues in the Christian life, what people say and what they do. And then a week ago, I was in a conference, and there were a number of pastors of large churches there, and we were having fellowship and a wonderful time of prayer, one of the most blessed times I've enjoyed in a long, long time. And in that discussion, we were looking at the problem that's in our country now with so many people falling into sin and so many people uh, claiming to be on the ball for the Lord, then all of a sudden bombing out. It was very interesting that some of the men with the highest degree of discipline and emphasis on it are among those who fall. And we were discussing this whole problem, and though my message was prepared, it only deepened my commitment to it. For in that discussion of some of America's best pastors and Bible-teaching men was the fact that we have a terrible problem in the Christian world that we're suffering from that very few people talk about. And that is there's a lot of seminars and skilled methodology being communicated in Christian circles about how to really live for the Lord and be discipled and be disciplined. And there's a lot of stuff available and a lot of emphasis on that. But in fact, the missing ingredient appears to be the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost as though we have become confident of what we can do. We have become skilled in our methodology and our approach to believe that we somehow are accomplishing all that God wanted us to. And yet, down deep, there's something wrong. There's very little trust upon the grace and mercy of God, very little emphasis on it. It's more on man and what he accomplishes and what he does. The strange thing is that it often comes in the midst of those who say that they're doing it to the glory of the Lord. And yet there is something wrong when our lifestyle does not match what the Scriptures actually teach, no matter what methods we use, no matter what our emphasis is. And I am very deeply concerned about this. I see it in the lives of God's people. I see people who have known the Lord for several years now who somehow feel that they are more righteous or more spiritual than they were the day they accepted Christ. It affects our attitudes towards people who come to Christ but may not look or act as we do now because of Christian knowledge and experience and associations. I'm here to tell you that we all are what we are because of the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled. And may God help us never to get away from the foundation of all that we are and have in Jesus Christ. It's His grace, it's His mercy, and it's His love. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul writes to Timothy, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, 
To God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, I pray in these few moments together that you will deepen our understanding of your grace and mercy and love for us. God, I pray that you would smash down all human efforts that emphasize our performance and our works, and you would build up in our minds the wonderful work of Christ, that we may once again see our total dependence upon him. God, I pray that you would help us to remember that our state today is something far different than what we shall be. God, I thank you for the sweet news of the gospel that one day we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be. God, I pray that we will put no confidence in the flesh, but we shall honor Jesus Christ, who is our sanctification, redemption, and righteousness, our justification, our wisdom. He is all to us. He is everything to us. And God, I pray that we will understand our position in Jesus Christ as we've never understood it before. God, I thank you for that, that we are cleansed by the precious blood of Christ and forgiven. We are pronounced and declared righteous because of what Jesus has done. God, may there be trust in your grace as we look at gifts and talents and resources and understand that it all comes from you. That We ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly, knowing that you have by your grace given us all that we have and are. And we thank you and praise you for it in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Abundant grace. What a passage. When God's abundant grace dominates your heart, your perspective, and your ministry as a Christian, I think there are at least the following things that are true of you. These five things I hope you will never forget, and they will deepen your walk and your ministry for the Lord. The first is found in verse 12 and 13. And that is when you understand that God's grace is the only thing that sustains you and makes you what you ought to be and can be, then you first of all recognize the mercy of God that allows you to serve Him. You recognize the mercy of God that allows you to serve Him. There is no room for arrogance in the Christian life, none whatsoever. There's no room for emphasizing what man does, what man is. You recognize the mercy of God. Let's look at these verses again. Paul said, I thank, literally, I constantly thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, persecuted and persecutor, an insolent man or violent aggressor, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief couple of things I want you to see about this. One is the result. Someone who recognizes God's mercy that allows him to serve the Lord, the result is always a continual state of thanksgiving. You never lose praise if you know the mercy of God. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. There is only one way and one way alone that I can stand before you and preach the gospel. There is only one way that anybody can stand up here and minister musically and worship. There's only one way that any of us can teach the word of God or serve the Lord with the multiple gifts that we have. And that is because of the mercy of God that holds back the judgment that we in fact do deserve. Paul says, I obtained mercy. And the result is that I constantly thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And I've, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, looking forward to this message. How easy it is for us not to thank the Lord for every opportunity and everything that he has given to us in our life. And that's rooted in the fact that our theology is messed up. If our theology is correct and we know God's mercy is holding back from us what we really deserve and we should constantly praise the Lord that he even wants to use us. I look at it this way. If he used Balaam's donkey, he can use me. Amen? I mean, we need to get straight in our theology about the whole thing. We're too enamored with man. And that is a sickness that is everywhere in the church in America as well as around the world. We're enamored with people and men. 
not recognizing that when you see somebody's gift or talent or ability being exercised, hey, the result should be, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. We ought to be praising the Lord for what he is doing. The reasons are twofold. The reasons behind this. I look at Paul's two statements. One is his faithfulness as a believer. He said, I constantly thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, New American says, strengthened me. Uh, the word enduno has the idea to clothe with. God's put some clothes on me that makes it possible for me to be in the ministry. And it says, because he counted me faithful. Now there's two ideas there. One is, that it's referring to Paul's faithfulness as a believer, consistently living out what he believes. The second idea is that Paul is trustworthy with it because he does understand the mercy and grace of God. And I think the second is more powerful. The reason why Paul is saying that the mercy of God has allowed him to serve the Lord is because he has in his life come to grips with the grace and mercy of God and is trustworthy because of it. He is trusting what the Lord has done in his life, his abundant grace, his wonderful mercy. In fact, the verses that follow that just reemphasize that point. Just glance through verse 14, 15, and 16, and you can't help but be persuaded that's the point. He is a faithful man, but he was enabled for that, to really trust God and his grace and his mercy. He was enabled by God himself. He's thanking Christ because he enabled me. There's a very interesting usage of that word enduno that translates enable or strengthen. It's the exact same word that's in Philippians 4.13. I want you to think about it. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who puts the clothes on me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to do them. And I wonder if we really believe that. I can do everything that God asked me to do only through the one who gives me the ability to do it. And all the clothes that he puts on me to make me adequate for service all comes as the result of his grace and his mercy. I believe also that Paul is indicating that his faith in the Lord made the difference because God's mercy was extended to him even when he was the opposite of what anyone might choose for the ministry. Let's look at this again, verse 13. This is hope for all of us. He says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, or a violent aggressor. Let's take a look at that. Turn to Acts, please, chapter 22. I wanted you to just focus on Paul, what he was, what he was formerly, because God's mercy was extended to Paul, and you would not have picked Paul because of what he had done. You might have picked Paul because of his Jewish background and training, but you would not have picked Paul as the favorite among Christians to succeed. He was the enemy of the Christians, and they were frightened over Paul's efforts to destroy them and to destroy the church. I read in Acts twenty-two nineteen, Paul said, So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. Paul was literally beating up people who believed in the Lord. Turn over to chapter 26. Look at what he said in verse 10 and 11. Chapter 26, verse 10 and 11. In recounting again his testimony, I think you'll find his testimony about six times in his writings. And in verse 10, he says, This I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, which probably indicates he was a member of the Sanhedrin. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly enraged against them. That's strong language. Paul has literally gone bonkers. He has lost control of himself. He is so angry, he has such a temper, that he cannot find enough words to tell us what he was like. You know, I have read a lot of books about Paul. And inevitably, the emphasis is on all of his training and background and expertise that prepared him for his ministry. And I think there's an emphasis in Paul's life that's missing as we look at Paul. Paul himself tells us that he was a madman against all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was a blasphemer. I was persecuted. I was violently aggressive. You would not choose him to have a ministry for the Lord. I read all of this and I say, man, the conversion of Paul is one of the amazing miracles of the New Testament. On that Damascus road, when Jesus said, 
Why do you persecute me? Back to 1 Timothy again. I think it's good, especially for those who are raised in the church and in good Christian environment, to understand that given the right opportunity and under the right temptation and provocation, we will commit the greatest of sins. It sometimes takes somebody whose background is a mess, who comes to Christ and sees his life changed, to remind us of what God's grace and mercy is all about. But in fact, there's not one of us, even if we've been raised in a Christian environment, have stayed away from the nasty nine or dirty dozen or whatever is our list, even though that is true, and we've had somewhat of a measure of Christian control and environment, the truth is that none of us would have come to Christ were it not for His mercy and grace. Amen? Now, the last part of verse 13 is very important. Paul said, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, I obtained mercy. What does he mean? I did it ignorantly. You see, there were two kinds of sins in the Old Testament law for which sacrifices uh, were brought. In fact, the one, no sacrifice remained. People would sin ignorantly, and they would sin willfully. Now, sinning willfully does not mean that those who sin ignorantly are not willfully involved in that sin. That is not what it means. To sin willfully deals with literally a high hand. It means I hear that I'm supposed to bring a sacrifice, but I don't believe in that sacrifice. Those people are sinning with a high hand, or they are sinning with a, a willful spirit, a willful rejection, and the Bible says for them there remains no more sacrifice for sin. They're rejecting the Lord, and as a result, he rejects them. And all those Israelis who did that were cut off from Israel forever, interestingly so. Everybody else who sins knows that he must bring a sacrifice or he will be lost forever. He must come through the sacrificial system. Now you bring that in the New Testament. If you reject God's grace... Hebrews calls it insulting the spirit of grace. If you reject that, there remains no sacrifice for you. All of us must come through the cross. What Paul is saying here, I recognize firmly in my life, Timothy, that the only reason I have this ministry is because I was sinning ignorantly, but I came to that sacrifice, which is the only solution to any of us. We must come through the Lord. And I did it ignorantly, therefore I obtained mercy. And God's grace was wonderful to me. I start by saying to all of us, if we're going to minister effectively for him or serve the Lord the way he wants, no matter what our talents, gifts, or resources, we must recognize the mercy of God that allows us to do so. Number two, look at verse 14 and 15. The second thing that I believe will be true of you if you understand God's grace is that you rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. You literally depend on it. You rely upon God's grace. You do not rely on your performance. And I like to call this a quiet tension in the believer's life. I don't know that I can adequately express all that I want to say in the short time we have. But I want you to know that there is a quiet tension in my heart and probably in every believer here over this issue. The tension is this. I know what this text is saying. But I sometimes lean towards what I might consider to be the essentials of walking with the Lord, and I depend upon my ability to do them rather than the grace of God. Are you following me? I don't know how to state it any more simply. For instance, wonderful resources like the Word of God. I really believe that we ought to read and study the Word of God as a daily habit in our lives. We need God's Word. But I find that it's possible for me to depend upon my ability to read and study the Bible as that which is the key to my service and growth for the Lord, rather than the grace of our Lord. Are you following me? I find the same thing about prayer. I believe we ought to pray. We should have prayer lists, and we should go to the Lord. But sometimes I believe that because I do that, somehow that is helping me to be more victorious. Are you following? Rather than trusting the grace of our Lord. A quiet tension goes on in the heart of the believer. And sometimes we don't know where we stand on this. I don't know where, whether I'm really trusting myself to do these things that I believe are essentials for discipleship or whether, in fact, I'm really trusting the grace of the Lord. I have to keep reminding me that I stand in my position before God on the sole basis of what Jesus Christ has done, not on what I do today. I have to keep reminding myself of that. So I see a quiet tension. The problem is we've got to always discern whether or not I'm trusting those things to make me live victoriously for the Lord, or whether I'm trusting the grace of our Lord. 
Do not parents have this struggle as well? We want to impose upon our children certain standards that we believe if they'd only follow, they could really be what God wants them to be. And almost by that, we are ignoring, sometimes even contradicting, what we know the Bible says about God's grace and mercy. You see, there always has to be in the heart of a believer who understands God's grace, the feeling every time he looks at somebody who falls into sin, there go I, but for the grace of God. It's that problem that when you see somebody really messed up, you say, well, I could have told you that would happen to him. It's that problem when you see somebody fall that says, well, I mean, what can you expect? I mean, look at the way he was. Is it not a part of the overall discussion currently about these leaders and televangelists and all the problems of it? And I'm not excusing or justifying because a lot of it is downright garbage. I'm not doing that. I'm simply saying, let's be careful, friends. Let's be very careful. There go I, but for the grace of our wonderful Lord. We need to rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. And there are two things from verse 14 and 15 I want you to see. One is that it's a sufficient grace for everything in your life. Paul said the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. How can you say it anymore? It's sufficient. It's exceedingly abundant. Turn please to Romans chapter 5. Now, God's grace is a little different from mercy. Mercy holds back from us what we deserve. Grace gives to us what we don't deserve. Grace is also translated gift. God gives us what we don't deserve. And there's a beautiful description of this, the gift of God in Romans chapter 5. You can glance with your eyes from verses 14, 15, all the way through 21 and see the contrast between God's gift and man's sin. But focus on verse 20 for a moment. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Isn't that interesting? God's law came in, and man really learned that he was a sinner. Back in chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, it says, By the law, all the world has become guilty before God, and by the law is the knowledge of sin. God literally put a heavy trip on us in the vernacular of today by giving us his law. When the law came, when the law entered, the offense abounded. I really saw what my sin was and how serious it was. But look at the next statement. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. He didn't say discipline abounded much more. He said grace abounded much more. And it seems to me that one of the frustrating things that happens in our Christian life is we want to get victory over sin, but instead of rooting it in the work of Christ and rooting it in God's grace and mercy, we sometimes root it in our own performance. And that leads to continuing frustration and defeat. And it's a tough problem. I don't know what you think about all this, but I know this. No matter how high a man's sins go, God's grace is much higher. Turn to Psalm 103 for a moment. And I think there's a great need currently in Christian circles for emphasizing the grace of our Lord, especially when we see the enormity of the sins of even so-called leaders of the church. I look in Psalm 103 at what God says. Verse 8. And are these precious words to anybody who knows the Lord? Psalm 103, verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Aren't you glad of that? Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are what? What? Dust. Amen? I have a sermon on self-image in which I teach that what God says we are is dust. Now, doesn't that really thrill you? Now, if I ask you, according to the Bible, what are you? You would say... Dust, that's all you are, dust. And as I look to this whole passage, I say, now wait a minute. I am a treasure to God. I am worth something to the Lord. I'm a new creation in Christ. Yet the Bible says that God, watch this carefully, He knows us and He always remembers that we are dust. It's fascinating. Do we always remember we're dust? Are you kidding? 
We rarely think about it. We look into the mirror and sometimes say, well, not bad, not bad. Needs a little work, but not too bad. God looks at us and says, dust. Isn't that thrilling? Now do you understand mercy and grace? So great is his mercy. Why? Because God, in fact, never forgets that we are dust. The Lord God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Before that, he formed man out of the dust of the ground. He remembers that we are dust, and the day you die, approximately about four days later, depending on what they do to your body, we're going to see that you are, in fact, dust. Amen? But let me tell you, what God does with that dust is absolutely miraculous, isn't it? God's wonderful grace and mercy. Back to 1 Timothy 1. What I'm trying to say to you is that when we really understand ministry for the Lord, we rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. And it's a sufficient grace because it's exceedingly abundant. That where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And it's not only a sufficient grace, it's a saving grace. It's the only thing that saves us. And that's why Paul says this in verse 15. This is a faithful saying. By the way, five times he says this is a faithful saying. Faithful is the word. And they're all in what we call the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. This is a faithful saying, something you can really count on. Faithful is the word. It's worthy of all acceptance. Everybody, this should be obvious to everybody. We should all immediately accept it if we understand the Bible. What is that? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief or foremost. Imagine writing to a man that you discipled and trained who's already been active in the ministry, still a young man, but instructing him about how he should run the churches and what he should do. And imagine telling him, by the way, Timothy, you do know why Jesus came, didn't you? He came to save sinners of whom I am the chief. You see, when you rely upon the God's, God's grace that makes it all possible, you understand it's not only sufficient in the sense it extends far beyond our sin, but it's the only thing that saves us. Turn, please, over to Ephesians and look at chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I do not believe it is ever wise or good for us to get away from the issue of God saving sinners. We are sinners saved by the grace of our Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, what a discussion Paul has here of grace as it relates to Christ coming to save sinners. In verse 1, it says, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come, he, he might ask you to give your testimony on what you've done for him. No. It says in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, meaning grace and salvation by grace, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast or anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I, I don't know a passage so critical on the subject of grace. I'm saved by grace, and one of God's reasons behind that is that there will be no one boasting. If anyone boasts, let him boast in the Lord. And doesn't it bother you a little bit, the way we boast as believers? Really, doesn't it? Let's come back to 1 Timothy 1 and look at this again. When I look at Paul's testimony, he says, man, I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, and violent person, but... I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and I obtained mercy, and God's grace was wonderful. And I just want you to know that God saves sinners, and I'm the foremost of them all. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came for people like me. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It never ceases to amaze me 
God's wonderful grace in saving people. When anybody tells me, you know, I know so-and-so, and they'll never be saved, I always get this little thrill in my heart. I don't know why it is. It just kind of jumps inside. I try to be cool, but I, I, I really get excited. I just think God probably smiles in heaven and says, just watch. You know, it's one of those things where you know we're going to get you. You know, when you write somebody off, you, you just have misunderstood God's wonderful grace and forgiveness. If you want to serve the Lord, you better rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. The third thing is to look at is in verse 16. And that is you must realize the purpose of God. What is the purpose of God? Why is he doing this? Verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy. Here he's going to give it. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I love that. You see, when you realize the purpose of God, it's based on two things. One, it's based on the patience of the Lord toward you. He says long suffering. That means taking a long time to boil. You want to know the truth about God's attitude towards me? Paul says, listen, he was long suffering, and I praise God for it. Turn over to 2 Peter and look at chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The purpose of God is based on the patience of Jesus Christ, the patience of the Lord, long suffering. I read in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, referring to believers, not willing that any, and obvious in the context in the preceding statement, any of us should perish, but that all, meaning all of us in the context, should come to repentance. And I look at that text and I don't want to argue about the exclusiveness of it. I simply want you to see that long suffering toward us was a part of the purpose of God. God is demonstrating something about his character as he saves people. The purpose of God, Paul said, is that God might demonstrate his long suffering towards me. The, the, the New Testament uses long suffering. In the Old Testament, you will most frequently find this as the words slow to anger. And you will find it everywhere. God is slow to anger. He's a long suffering God. Aren't you glad of that? When did you get saved? Think about it. But it's also based on the pattern that Paul would become to others. I look at verse 16, back to 1 Timothy again, and it's the pattern, Paul says, that is a part of the purpose of God. God wants to do this. He saved me, though I didn't deserve it. He saved me to be a pattern, an outline, a sketch to those who are going to believe on him. People are going to look at my life and know that God can save them as well. What a beautiful thing. God saves people by his grace and makes them a pattern, an example, a type to all of those who are going to believe on him. So what have we learned so far? If you really understand God's grace, you recognize the mercy of God that allows you to serve him. Secondly, you rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. Third, you realize the purpose of God. Number four, verse 17. If you understand his grace then you return all the glory to God. You never take credit yourself. You return all the glory to God because you know grace made it possible. What a summary, verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. Some translations leave out the word wise. The manuscript evidence, I believe, supports it. To God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Two things I draw to your attention. Why do we return all the glory to God? Paul gives two reasons, really, in that verse. One is because of his sovereign position as king. Now to the king. Interesting that he choose that word. He could have used a number of words to describe the Lord. But now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. It's because of his sovereign position as king of kings and lord of lords that we turn all the glory to him. No one takes that place. And secondly, if you really return all the glory to God... It's because of his unique plan. The point of wise there is very critical, and I believe the manuscript evidence, as I said, supports it, and it's critical to the point. First, to the king. Second, to God who, who is wise. To God who alone is wise. And the wisdom he's referring to is his plan to save those who are sinners by grace and mercy. And it's because of that plan that we return all the glory to God. Let me give an example. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to show you God's unique plan, demonstrating his wisdom. 
is the point behind this. Saving sinners and getting glory through it. That's why we are to return all the glory to God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it says, Since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God's wisdom. Verse 26, you seek uh, your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. He chose the weak things to put to shame the things that are mighty, and so on and so forth. What are we talking about here? The wisdom of God. Verse 6 of chapter 2, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age are coming to nothing. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And to that I say, amen. Do you? Man, praise the Lord. All it's coming. Why? Because God is wise. God had a plan to save people, not on the basis of their performance, but on the basis of His grace and His love. Turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. And look at this one passage exalting the wisdom of God's plan. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. After discussing in three chapters about how God's sovereign plan works, how he's brought people to himself that nobody thought he would. He ends this discussion in Romans eleven thirty three 33 with this statement. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's a quotation from Isaiah, which deals with God pardoning people who don't deserve it. Did you hear what I just said? I hear a lot of Christians taking this out of context where God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, etc. And they use it in different context. The context of that in Isaiah is God pardons and forgives people who don't deserve it. And from a human point of view, you say, man, how can God do that? But all the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, his ways are past finding out. He will forgive when nobody else will. What a text. Why should we return all the glory to God? One, because of his sovereign position as king. And secondly, because of his unique plan. He is the only one who is wise. It is his wisdom that's being exalted. In Ephesians 3, it tells us that the angels even can't figure it out. It's also repeated in 1 Peter 1. The angels of God, looking at God saving sinners who don't deserve it, are mystified by the whole thing. God says that he is showing his manifold, many-sided wisdom to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. He's showing to them how wise he is by saving dust. You following now? All the angels are saying, what in the world is God doing? Doesn't he know how rotten those people are? And God is showing to them the many sides of his wisdom and his wonderful plan by saving people who don't deserve it. And you ask me why? I'm upset and we all should be upset over what we see as arrogance among Christian leaders. Dust. That's all we are. But God has taken that and shaped it for his glory. And we need to praise him constantly. One more thing. Back to 1 Timothy 1. We've said so far that you need to recognize the mercy of God that allows you to serve Him. And secondly, Timothy and all of us, you need to rely upon the grace of God that makes it all possible. And third, you need to realize the purpose of God in this. And fourth, you need to return all the glory to God. And finally, you need to respond with commitment to God. Interesting that after saying all this, the very next words in verse 18 are, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. After talking about God's grace, to save sinners. Now he says, do something about it. If you understand what I say, then I am committing to you, Timothy, a great responsibility. So if you understand God's abundant grace, how do you respond? With more commitment to God. You bring the law into my life and I get wiped out. Paul said when the law came, I coveted it and my problems got worse. But you bring grace into a person's life and understand what God is doing and what happens. He responds with commitment to the Lord. You know, I was thinking about this as I was studying it. And you know, the more I know about God's grace and mercy, it's interesting. It's like you fall in love with him again. 
See, it's God's grace, really, that motivates us into ministry. Not law and heavy trips and discipline, although discipline is a part of the Christian life, and don't misunderstand. But God's grace, that God loves me, and He saved me, and I don't deserve anything He's doing. It's fantastic. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. Three things I'd have you notice there in verses 18 to 20. One, Paul told Timothy to rely upon God's word. Very simply stated, Timothy, you've got a charge according to the prophecies that were previously made concerning you. Flip over to chapter 4, please, verse 14. What's he talking about? Chapter 4, verse 14. Paul said to Timothy, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery or the elders. God used these elders to speak. There was no New Testament information like we have now. Paul obviously is sending this book to him. It hasn't been written yet. Timothy's never seen it till he gets this. And what he's saying is, Timothy, you remember how God spoke to us about you and your gifts. I don't want you to forget it. Isn't it interesting that that follows grace? God's grace, God's mercy, we are sinners, God has saved us. Oh, by the way, Timothy, because of that, don't forget what we said about you. Because whatever gifts we have, whatever commitment, whatever service we have, comes from the gracious hand of the Lord. Timothy, don't ever forget what we said to you. Then if you look again at verses 19 and 20, you notice that there's a battle. He's telling Timothy to not only rely upon the word of God that was spoken to him about his gifts and responsibility, but secondly, to realize that he has a battle to face. And he needs to remember the grace of the Lord if he's going to handle it properly. That by them, verse 18, you may wage the good warfare. Ephesians 6 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this world. We're in a spiritual battle, people. And you know why a lot of people are falling away? Because they've lost sight of the grace and mercy of our Lord. Don't trust yourself. Trust the Lord. The third thing that I believe he mentions to Timothy, which you'll expand on later, is that we must recognize the dangers that we inevitably face. Don't go off from here, Paul's saying, thinking that there are no dangers, because there are. Look at verse 19. Have faith in a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Those dangers are there. We need to recognize the dangers that we must inevitably face. Hymenaeus and Alexander, I don't know who they are, but I do believe that Hymenaeus is mentioned in the second letter. Turn to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. And there's just a little bit more information here. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. It says, speaking about those who are spreading profane and vain babblings. Verse 17, their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. So now we learn a little bit about Hymenaeus. Who Alexander is, I don't know. First of all, Alexander, the name Alexander in that society is everywhere. It's everywhere. Everybody's named Alexander, so I don't know exactly who it is. But I have a feeling because of the unusual nature of the name Hymenaeus, it's the same guy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He refers to him again. Now, what does it mean when he says, he delivered them to Satan? What does that mean? Turn to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 5. Now, I'll show you the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What does it mean, he delivered them to Satan? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have a man who's guilty of incest, and he claims to be a member of the church. And Paul is rebuking the church for tolerating it. They've never dealt with it. Paul tells them they're puffed up, and they should have been mourning over this and dealing with it, but they didn't. Now look at verse 4. We'll pick it up at verse 4, 1 Corinthians 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He'll pay in his life the consequences of his immorality, in other words. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, as you keep reading, he tells him what to do. 
Verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges. He's telling them to judge those who are in their membership. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. So what is he asking them to do? He's asking them to excommunicate the guy who was guilty of incest, who did not repent, and he's asking them to deal with it. So delivering to Satan means to get them out of the church, and it assumes that Satan's realm is the world, Christ's realm is the church. So there's a beautiful metaphor there, in a sense, for our understanding. Get him out, deliver him to the realm of Satan, because in that realm, we'll find out whether he's really a Christian. If he can continue that lifestyle and nothing happens... We know the guy never knew the Lord. If he's really a believer, that man will become convicted and he will know. He will be miserable and we will have the opportunity to see whether or not that guy really knows the Lord or he doesn't. So put him out of your church. If he's a Christian, he'll get under conviction about it. But if he's not, he won't. So as we come back to 1 Timothy, what Paul is telling Timothy is so important. If you understand God's grace, it doesn't mean that you just let sin run rampant or never deal with anything. Timothy, you have a responsibility before God that should arise out of that. You should respond with commitment to God to do what God wants you to do. And there are people that you must recognize because of what they have said or believe or done are not representing us properly. Deliver them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. They were in false doctrine and Timothy had to deal with them. I look at this whole passage and I say, man, what a what an argument for every one of us who serve the Lord. God's wonderful grace. You ever heard that song, He Giveth More Grace? It says on the chorus that His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundaries known unto man. Boy, is that ever true. And when we are struggling with sin, I wonder, do you go back to the cross and look at His grace? Or do you constantly... Try to get the victory by your own efforts. This is a struggle, isn't it? The Bible says that we must obey the word of God to clean up our lives. The Bible tells us to watch and pray that we do not enter into temptation. And yet on the other side is the constant emphasis of the grace of our Lord. The Bible says in Romans 6 to count yourself to be dead into sin but alive unto God. That's just an issue of faith. It tells us to remember that our old sin nature, our old man was crucified with Christ. Uh, Paul wrote in Galatians 2 that you will not get anywhere trying to keep the law. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I do live. Yet the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then my faith is dead in vain. Dear friends, listen to me. You will frustrate the grace of God in your life if you think by trying to keep the law of God, you will become victorious. You will not. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When we get our eyes off of the Lord, we're heading for a fall. It is God's grace and God's mercy that has made our ministry for him possible. Let's close with prayer. Father, you know Our natural tendency is to exalt in ourselves. And our natural tendency is to emphasize our performance and what we have accomplished. Oh God, I pray that you will renew our commitment to the grace and mercy of our Lord. God, you've been so good to us. You have saved us by grace. You sustain us by grace. You tell us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I do not know where all these people are in their relationship with you, but you do. And God, I would pray for those here in our audience that have never come to accept the salvation of Christ by his grace. Perhaps they have felt because of previous religious affiliation or because of their performance that somehow they are Christian. God, help them to realize that it was because Jesus died on the cross and rose again that we can ever have eternal life. He paid the price that we could not pay. We could never earn his favor, for grace gives to us what we do not deserve. God, help them to come to Jesus before it's too late. And God, I'm so thankful for the encouragement of your grace, for I know that nobody is outside the realm of your power to save. Oh, God, I thank you that where sin abounds, your grace did much more abound. You love us so much, you'll forgive us no matter what has been done. God, I thank you for that. And I pray that all of us will rejoice in your wonderful grace 
and seek to serve you in the light of it and the fullness of it. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.